So Hillary Clinton has now joined the Jill Stein quixotic recount effort in swing states, including Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Campaign counsel Mark Elias announced that while the Clinton campaign had no evidence of hacked voting systems, they wanted to ensure the veracity of the vote. Quote, because we had not uncovered any actionable evidence of hacking or outside attempts to alter the voting technology, we had not planned to exercise this option ourselves. But now that a recount has been initiated in Wisconsin, we intend to participate in order to ensure the process proceeds in a manner that is fair to all sides, unquote. Stein is infamously launching a recount effort, if you missed it, in an obvious effort to raise money for the Green Party. So, what's the goal here? Well, not to overturn election results, clearly, because Hillary lost. But Ron Fournier of National Journal raises another awful, horrifying possibility, quote, Raising doubts about the legitimacy of the election, even without overturning the result, is part of Clinton's plans to keep her options open for 2020. Make some calls. You'll hear the same from her confidants. Or no. Except this would actually be the best case scenario for Republicans. Hillary was a historically bad candidate. She was the first female major party candidate in history, and she was somehow unable to beat the guy who was caught on tape talking about grabbing women by the bleep. Her husband was a president with significant blue-collar appeal. She lost the blue-collar white vote in historic fashion. She didn't even match Barack Obama's numbers among Hispanics. After Trump openly said a judge of Mexican descent couldn't judge his case fairly, she relied on Hollywood glitz rather than on-the-ground campaigning, and she paid for it with the White House. Hillary for re-election in 2020 would be incredible for Republicans. It would be so great. She'd be back. She'd be twice as annoying, which is almost mathematically impossible. She'd have half the enthusiasm, again, almost mathematically impossible. And she'd have half the energy level, which means that she would be twice as dead. Meanwhile, she would suck all of the oxygen out of the room, preventing other candidates from rising. Her corruption would ensure any future Trump corruption would be negated as a campaign issue. Republicans should pray for more Hillary Clinton. In a way, though, Hillary doesn't really have much of a choice. Donations to the Clinton Foundation have plummeted since her loss, since there's no pay if there's no pay for play. What happens to her if she merely becomes a failed presidential candidate? Hillary needs access in order to sell the access. So, watch for a Hillary comeback. We can only hope and pray that, once again, Hillary's ego drives her to new lows. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Okay, so much to get to today on this post-Thanksgiving Day show. We're back, and we're kind of in the, the nice period of the year, this, this period between Thanksgiving and New Year's where everybody calms down a little bit. We calm all the way up till the inauguration, except for the continuing chaos that emerges from the left and from the White House on a consistent basis. So we'll keep you up to date on all of that. But first, we say hello to our advertisers over at Lyft. So if you are in need of a ride somewhere and you don't want to get in a car driven by an insane person uh, or you don't want to get into a cab because they're very expensive. Lyft is the best ride sharing app there is. Right now, if you go to Lyft and you download their app, if you enter promo code Shapiro, you get up to $10 off three free rides. So you get you get $10, three free rides, 30 bucks in case you couldn't do the math. If you download that free Lyft app today and you enter the promo code Shapiro in the payment section, you get that $30 value for free, which is awesome. Promo code Shapiro. So I use Lyft. My wife uses Lyft. That's important to me because my wife works all hours. Uh, she's, she's constantly coming home very late at night after taking care of people in the ER. And sometimes uh, she actually has to come home uh, to on, uh, on Shabbos. She has to come home on Saturdays uh, because she's a doctor, which means that in emergency situations she's allowed to work. But she uses rideshare apps because you're really not supposed to drive. So instead... She uses Lyft to get home, and uh, and the and the, that's the uh, that's the best way uh, to do it. The the best way to do it is Lyft. Again, safest drivers. Uh, they have the the best capacity for taking you in a safe way. Uh, Lyft is the place to be. So go get that app right now and use promo code Shapiro thirty dollar value for free. All righty. So. There was some good news over the weekend, some really good news over the weekend. An evil piece of crap died, so that's always excellent. Uh, Fidel Castro bit the bullet uh, 90 years too late. Um, I shouldn't say that. Maybe he was a good child. I don't know. But but certainly uh, about 60 years too late, he took over Cuba at age 32. So any time before that, he could have gone. That would have been all right. Um, he, he did an enormous amount of damage to people. The media have treated him as though he was a controversial figure as opposed to a mass mur- murdering barbaric dictator. Uh, he was basically low-rent Stalin for people who, who don't know much about Fidel Castro. And I want to go through and talk a little bit about what Fidel Castro actually did, because the left will never tell you straight exactly what was wrong with Fidel Castro, because the thing about Fidel Castro for the left is the left is pretty much fine. The left is pretty much okay with anything that, the, that other leftists do. They, they, they're not in love with the mass murder, but if mass murder has to get done in order to create the new utopia, they can live with it. So the front page of the New York Times said, a revolutionary who defied the U.S. and held Cuba in his thrall. 
Well, he didn't actually hold Cuba in his thrall. He actually created a giant gulag and sentenced everybody in the country to stay in it. And he wasn't a revolutionary so much as he was a socialist dictator who murdered all dissidents. Um, but I think that it's important to go through some of the facts about, about Fidel Castro. So we will do that today. So first of all, Fidel Castro took over the country in 1959. He took over from a guy named General Batista. General Batista was also a dictator, but he was sort of a right-wing dictator. Uh, and General Batista, under Batista, Cuba was one of the richest countries in Latin America. Uh, it was on the upswing. It was sort of like, uh, not a good guy, Batista, but m m sort of like Pinochet, except less violent. Uh, he was eventually going to end up transitioning into uh, a, d a form of democracy in all likelihood. Instead, there was a violent revolution with Castro at its source. And here is Fidel Castro taking power. Here's what it looked like. Outside Havana's presidential palace, hundreds of thousands rally at the call of revolutionary leader Fidel Castro, who estimated their number at a million. Most of the throng wears the colors of Castro's 26th of July movement. They are in an exultant mood as the man who overthrew the Batista dictatorship calls on them to approve the public trials and executions of pro-Batista figures guilty of war crimes and atrocities. The executions, some 250 to date, have been widely criticized by many as too hasty and summary, even if justified. Says Castro, the Cuban revolutionary government has no reason to offer explanations to America or to anyone except the people of Cuba. Castro asks his audience if it favors the summary court-martial. He gets his answer in a roar of approval. So all in all, he ended up executing thousands and thousands of people. Uh, he conspired with the mass murderer Che Guevara, we'll talk about Che in just a minute, to overthrow Fulgencia Batista, who was that dictator, and then he began a guerrilla campaign resulting in his takeover of the island. He immediately exiled priests, he exiled all, all religious figures, he destroyed religious schools, he nationalized all businesses, he imprisoned and murdered his, and murdered his enemies. Within the first three months, he had between 600 and 1,100 people shot. Che Guevara said, there's a direct quote from Che, this, this piece of crap who you see people walking around with his face on T-shirts. It's like walking around, uh, again, with a Stalin T-shirt. He said, to send men to the firing squad, judicial proof is unnecessary, is what Che Guevara said. These procedures are an archaic bourgeois detail. This is a revolution. And a revolutionary must become a cold-killing machine motivated by pure hate. We must create a pedagogy of the paradon. That's the, the execution wall. So you have to teach people through the execution wall. Castro actually imprisoned more of his citizens by percentage than Hitler or Stalin. By 1961, he had imprisoned 300,000 human beings. He asked the Soviet Union to actually nuke the United States in 1961 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Castro supported terrorist groups all over the world, ranging from FARC in Colombia to Shining Path in Peru and the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Hundreds of thousands of Cubans fled. Millions, actually. Many drowned in the ocean. Thousands of people drowned in the ocean as they attempted to sail to Florida. Between 1959 and 1992, at least 2 million Cubans fled Cuba. Now, some of the lies that you'll be told is that he didn't impoverish Cuba. He absolutely did. The average GDP per capita in, in Cuba uh, when Castro took over was a little bit over $2,000 per person per year. By 1999, the average GDP per capita, remember, this is a 40-year period. By 1999, the per capita GDP in the nation was $2,300. So it had advanced $300 in 40 years. According to Discover the Networks, the average daily wage for agriculture workers in Cuba in 1958 was 3 bucks. The average daily wage in France at the time was $2.73. Cuba had in 1958, the year before Castro took over, the highest standard of living uh, of any Latin American country and half of Europe. Here's the Wall Street Journal. The Cuba that Castro inherited was developing but relatively prosperous and ranked third in Latin America in doctors and dentists and daily calorie consumption per capita. Its infant mortality rate was the lowest in the region and the 13th lowest in the world. Cubans were among the most literate Latins and had a vibrant civic life with private, professional, commercial, religious, and charitable organizations. Castro destroyed all of it. He ruined agriculture by imposing collective farms, making Cuba dependent first on the Soviets and later on oil from Hugo Chavez's Venezuela. In the past half century, Cuba's export growth has been less than Hades. And now even doctors are scarce because so many are sent abroad to earn foreign currency. Hospitals don't even have sheets or aspirin. The average monthly income is $20. Government food rations are inadequate. As for that health care, you always hear about the Cuban health care. Absolute crap. There are three systems. There are the socialist revolutionaries who get good care. There are the foreigners who come and pay with cash, like Fat Michael Moore. And then there is, and then there is the actual people of Cuba this is according to Jay Nordlinger of National Review. He said, hospitals and clinics are crumbling. Conditions are so unsanitary, patients may be better off at home, whatever home is. If they do have to go to the hospital, they must bring their own bed sheets, soap, towels, food, light bulbs, even toilet paper. 
That's how poor health care is. Imagine you go to the hospital and you have to bring your own light bulbs and toilet paper. Basic medications are scarce. Doctors have been known to reuse latex gloves. Okay, the whole point of latex gloves is that you don't reuse them. As for the infant mortality rate, they're constantly bragging about the infant mortality rate. That's because they do all sorts of prenatal checkups, so they want to keep that statistic artificially high. And the way that they do that is they do prenatal checkups. If there's any danger to the pregnancy at all, they simply abort the kid. So the abortion rates in Cuba are extraordinarily, extraordinarily high. It really is a horrifying system of government, and that's been brought about by, by the Castro's. But look how the media just worship the Castro. So this is Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan uh, had on Castro. Uh, this is 1961, I believe, uh, or 1959. And here's Ed Sullivan, who's then the most popular television host in the United States, praising Fidel Castro. Well, now, in, in school, I understand you were a very fine student, a very fine athlete. Were you a baseball pitcher? Yes, baseball pitcher. Basketball, basketball, track, yeah. team, football, and every, every, everything, every sport. Well, undoubtedly, all of that exercise you did in school prepared you for this role. Yes, now. it helped me very much now in this world. You no, know, this is a fine young man, and a very smart young man. With the help of God and our prayers, and with the help of the American government, he will come up with the sort of democracy down there that America should have. He'll create the sort of democracy America should have? Unbelievable. This is how the media treated Fidel Castro, a mass-murdering dictator. Mass-murdering dictator. Castro on Face the Nation. Here is, here is Castro appearing on Face the Nation. This is from 1959. Because public opinion in Cuba is now very strong and with a tremendous force. Nobody is enough powerful to op opposite now the public opinion of the free country of Cuba. Dr. Okay, so he says that public opinion will drive, and this is always what socialist revolutionaries, would-be dictators say. Whenever somebody talks about public opinion making might right, that's never a good thing. It's why demagogues are scary, right? People who come up and they say, well, the public says I can do this. It doesn't matter what the law says. It doesn't matter what the Constitution says. The people want it. We'll have summary executions. Again, tens of thousands of people murdered, hundreds of thousands of people imprisoned by Fidel Castro. Okay, here's Che Guevara at the, at the United Nations talking about human rights. It says, as Fidel Castro has said, so long as the concept of sovereignty exists as the prerogative of nations and of independent peoples, as a right of all peoples, we will not accept the exclusion of our people from that right. Nosotros no aceptaremos la exclusión de nuestro pueblo de ese derecho. So long as the world is governed by these principles, so long as the world is governed by those concepts that have universal validity, because they are universally accepted and recognized by the peoples, we will not accept the attempt to deprive us of any of those rights, and we will renounce none of those rights. So he's basically saying here, Che Guevara in 1964 in front of the United Nations, three years later he was dead, and he was dead because uh, he went into other parts of Latin America and attempted to lead coups there, communist coups there. So he's talking there about how nobody should interfere with Cuba, and then he promptly went to Latin America and attempted to start a revolution in Bolivia uh, and was killed for his trouble. Thank God. He was a really terrible human being, Che Guevara. For, you want to see what it was like for Cubans living in, in Castro's Cuba. People still are, by the way, thanks to the incompetence of Barack Obama and this idiotic policy imposed over the last 50 years in the United States. I've never been in favor of this policy that the United States has with regard to, uh, to non-assassination. Uh, it makes no sense to me. I don't see why literally millions upon millions, generations of people should live in terror and suffering because we have to let an old piece of crap, like uh, an old, disgusting, desiccated piece of human debris like Fidel Castro live. We would have been better off killing him. Um, but uh, but here's, here's what it was like in Cuba and still is like in Cuba. People can't escape. It's a giant prison. Uh, here is uh, some footage of Cuban refugees. Here's what people were doing just to get out of Castro's Cuba while all of these Westerners were praising Cuba as this halcyon of light and liberty. Here is, here's what it actually looked like for people trying to get out. In 2003, news media the world over broadcast this image. A dozen Cubans sailing for freedom aboard an old green Chevy truck. Luis and his three-year-old son, Angel, were on board. Luis explained to me that few new cars entered Cuba after the revolution in the 1950s, but his old one worked just fine. He tells me he was scared building the boat in secret and pushing from shore in the dark of night. But he was willing to risk everything for a better life in America. 
Okay, I mean, this is, again, hundreds of thousands of people uh, attempting to escape Cuba. In, in the early 1980s, there were so many people trying to escape that Fidel Castro actually said fine, and then he sent uh, a, a huge number of kind of the, the Cuban criminal class, uh, he let them escape. He let all the criminals go to, to Miami, uh, and that's why you saw a major upsurge in crime and, and the drug trade in Miami uh, in the early part of the 1980s. But people have been attempting to float in cars. I mean, this is how you ended up with, with the situation uh, with... Um, the what was the uh, Gonzalez? What, what was the name of the the kid who was deported back to Cuba uh, after his after his dad died on the way over uh, from or his mother died on the way over from Cuba and then he was deported back to Cuba uh, thanks to the Clinton administration. Uh, people have been attempting to get out of Cuba for for fifty years thanks to the Castros. Uh, Here is some footage of, of Castro's prisoners speaking about what it was like to be a dissident in Castro's Cuba. It was like being in the depths of hell. The suffering made me a little crazy, but my husband and children wrote to me and that kept me going, she said. Callardo and her husband Angel were arrested at a small anti-government demonstration in May 2014. Their crime, they say, chanting down with Fidel Castro. Education for Cubans has been about fear and how to be afraid, about how to avoid confrontation with the authorities because they have power. They teach you what they want you to know, but not really what goes on in the world, he said. Both were released on January 8th, according to their prison papers. The pair spent eight months behind bars in what they say were appalling conditions. Okay, and that's not unusual. Lots of people died and just went missing uh, in, in Castro's prisons. Uh, Castro had a special hatred for homosexuals, so very early in his regime, he basically rounded up homosexuals. Here is testimony from some, some gay folks who were rounded up by Fidel Castro and put in prison camps. La juventud, la Unión de Jóvenes Comunistas llevaba una lista a de los list candidatos a ser depurados. Algunos de estos candidatos sabían que iban a ser depurados y por lo tanto no iban. Otros sabían, no lo sabían y se daban cuenta allí. Las humillaciones the humiliation durante las asambleas meetings. de depuración consistían Consistent en que se obligaba a todas las personas present. que estaban presentes a decir to todos los insultos inimaginables a la persona que estaba siendo depurada. Eh, y era algo de lo que no nada, las personas no se podían escapar. Y había gente que, There were people que who no couldn't lo podían soportar porque nunca se lo imaginaron y se suicidaban porque enfrentarse, Not only no solamente a la humillación esta pública de la universidad, sino a, su, a la humillación familiar, tener que volver a la casa They y decir, had to go home and say, al padre o a la madre me votaron de la universidad porque me acusaron de ser homosexual. Some killed themselves. Okay, that was not uncommon in Castro's Cuba. Uh, and uh, again, th this is somebody who m mass executions were not were not uncommon uh, in Castro's Cuba. Here is a here is a, a footage of one of the original executions. This was released by the Castro regime very early on. Uh, this was uh, supposedly a member of uh, Batista's regime. So delightful folks, delightful folks. The reason that I do all of this is because the left in America and in the West glorify people like Castro. They really do. Uh, and it's truly disgusting. So first we're going to give you, and we're going to have to, first let me take a break real fast and so say hello to our friends over at Trunk Club. So on the lighter side, obviously, it's now Black Friday, it's, Black Friday, it's, it's Cyber Monday, it's, it's the, the week of deals. And over at trunkclub.com slash Ben, you go there and you sign up right now. You use the trunkclub.com slash Ben. And uh, it's a great gift that you can buy for yourself. You can buy it for a family member. What's great about Trunk Club, the way that this works is that they have all of these people who are consultants who you can text with, you can, you can chat with, and they help you pick out the kind of clothes that you want. Uh, and they, they help tailor those clothes, make sure that they fit you properly. And then they send you a trunk of the kind of clothes that you're looking for. You keep what you want. You send back what you don't. Uh, you only get a trunk when, you're, when you are ordering you know, certain types of clothing. So it's not like it just comes every month and becomes a hassle. If you don't like it, you send it right back. Uh, and uh, they also have these clubhouses that are really great, places like Boston and New York, Chicago, L.A., Dallas, D.C., Charleston. They all have these clubhouses. I've been to the one out in L.A. It's great. You actually meet with a stylist. They go through your wardrobe. They tell you exactly what you need, and they help guide you through the process. And all of their stuff is really beautifully made. It's all top brand stuff. It takes, you know, building a really good wardrobe takes time, uh, and you should really get top end items. It's better to get one top end item that you're going to wear a bunch of times than it is to get a bunch of crappy items that are going to fall apart immediately. A trunk club is for the best 
quality materials, the best quality stuff. It's not a subscription service. You order the clothes whenever you like from your own stylist. You take five days to try everything on. You can send it back. You can ask them for advice. You have their text, uh, so you can text back and forth. You can even help pair up the new clothes with the old clothes uh, over at Trunk Club. And your stylist is a professional. I've worked with their professionals. They really are top notch. It's trunkclub.com slash Ben, trunkclub.com slash Ben. So, Back to our story. The reactions to the Castro death are really quite telling. The difference between right and left on the Castro death uh, is really quite amazing. So Donald Trump gave what I thought is the, the best thing that he's done this entire campaign. It's the best thing that I've done that I think that Donald Trump has done uh, since he since he announced. Here was Donald Trump's statement on the on the death of Fidel Castro. And he didn't write this, but it doesn't matter. He's the president-elect, so he put it out. It says, quote, Today, the world marks the passing of a brutal dictator who oppressed his own people for nearly six decades. Fidel Castro's legacy is one of firing squads, theft, unimaginable suffering, poverty, and the denial of fundamental human rights. While Cuba remains a totalitarian island, it is my hope that today marks a move away from the horrors endured for so long and toward a future in which the wonderful Cuban people finally live in the freedom they so richly deserve. Though the tragedies, deaths, and pains caused by Fidel Castro cannot be erased, our administration will do all it can to ensure the Cuban people can finally begin their journey toward prosperity and liberty. I join the many Cuban Americans who supported me so greatly in the presidential campaign, including the Brigade 2506 Veterans Association that endorsed me, with the hope of one day soon seeing a free Cuba. This is the best statement that there was from any world leader on this. That's exactly right. Fidel Castro does not deserve one iota of praise. Ryan's Priebus came out and he said, look, you know, Obama's famous deal that he did with the, with the Castros, we'll just renege on it. We're not going to do that anymore. Um, because that deal is a total train wreck and everybody knows it and any, anything that we can do to get rid of it, we will. Now, there's parts of it that may be very difficult to, to get out of, but we're going to take a fresh look at it, put fresh eyes on that deal. And I can assure you, if anyone can renegotiate that deal or do something about it to make it better for the American people and not start a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, it's going to be President-elect Trump. Okay, so if he, if he rips up the Cuba deal, that would be a wonderful thing, obviously. Uh, Ted Cruz says the Obama administration has strengthened the Cuban regime. Clearly they have. Unfortunately, the policies of, of the Obama administration ha have made that less likely. What, what the Obama administration has done is strengthened Raul Castro. Raul is the dictator now. Uh, you know, I asked my dad at dinner last night, well, what do you think happens now that Fidel is dead? And, and he shrugged and said, Raul's been in charge for years. The, the, the system has gotten stronger. And what Obama has done is funneled billions of dollars to Raul Castro, which is being used to oppress dissidents. You know, in 2015, roughly 10,000 political arrests occurred in Cuba. That is five times as many as occurred in 2010, when there were only about 2,000. This tyrannical regime has gotten stronger because of a weak president, weak foreign policy, and, and it is very much my hope and belief that with a new president coming into office in January, President Trump, a new administration, that, that, that U.S. foreign policy, not just to Cuba, but towards our enemies, whether they are Iran or North Korea, will no longer be a policy of weakness and appeasement, but instead using U.S. strength to force and, and press for change Okay, so that's the okay. So here is the uh, so so that is the uh, the left. Uh, th that's the right's take on on the Castro death. For more, for, for the left's take, and this is where it really gets interesting, you, you're going to have to go to dailywire.com and subscribe. Uh, we have to cut off the live broadcast on Facebook and YouTube now. But if you become a subscriber at dailywire.com, 8 bucks a month gets you access, $8 a month uh, only. And if you become an annual subscriber, we're still giving away my book for free, signed copies of my book, True Allegiance. Uh, plus, you get to be part of the mailbag once you're a subscriber. Uh, we do a live mailbag on Thursdays. We'll be doing that this week, as we do every week. Uh, and uh, you get the rest of the show live as well. Plus, there are other goodies that are coming soon. If you're a subscriber, also, you don't have to look at the ads on our site, the annoying pop-up ads on our site. So, dailywire.com to become a subscriber or go later and listen to the rest of the show over at SoundCloud or iTunes. We are the largest conservative podcast in the United States.